Okay, good day, everyone. My name is uh, Chiedu Nobetonabu, and uh, voice actor and content creator. Uh, I, I would say this is a dream come true, being in the same room with um, people with like minds, uh, like voices. Let's put it that way. Um, there's a smattering of people around who, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, we just talk, and it's been years. This kind of thing has been years coming. I'd like to give a big shout-out to the convener of the conference, Emmanuel Afemike. He is phenomenal. Sometimes I, in fact, back then, and um, the career, depending on where you're coming from, I'm sure we all know that there's this, there's this thing with, uh, would I say, according to um, Nene Woko yesterday, the hills and valleys of the, when you are in that valley, hmm, sometimes it even starts to manifest physically. You find yourself going back in a lot of things, especially when you have the passion. I'm thankful a lot of greats are among us here today. And um, we, we thought we would have much more people, but I believe we're enough to represent the, um, the craft as it is. Uh, so I, I have the pleasure of actually hosting this uh, panelist session. And um, I have Eric Maximus Equeme, who we are kind of waiting for, I think. <laughs> okay, but I've also got Lord Frank and Ahidi Adu. I won't even deny the research I carried out on these two men. <laughs> so um, we could start off with, uh, with uh, both of you. And um, I think, okay, let's, let's make it a bit closer so we don't, we know there's COVID and all, but let's, <laughs> let's do respect. <laughs> okay, so we'll just dive straight in uh, because um, the business of voiceover in a competitive age is really one of the most important things right now. And um, just like Wale Kundaya was saying, you might have a great voice. Even uh, Stephanie said that a few minutes ago. But if you're not able to leave that legacy and be able to make it sell, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Had to make the grand entrance. <laughs> so that's Eric uh, Equebe. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much for coming in. Okay, so. Uh, okay, I'll just throw it through that. And I'm trying to just finish recording one voiceover now. Just rush this. <laughs> <laughs> <That's not true. laughs> All right. So, um, the business of voiceover in a competitive age. Yeah. And um, I'm going to start off first with uh, Ahide. Okay, and I think the way I'll do this, I'll give a, a start off first with you, and then I think every other person could chime in. And right after then, a personal question that's from your own perspective. Because um, as much as it is a joint effort, what we're doing here, we have our niches, we have what we're really good at, that part that we know that this is golden. So would always, I'd also like you to give your own perspective or from your point of view, or from your experience, personal experience, what it's also been like. Okay, so um, over time, what has the business of the craft been like for you? Talking about costs, you know, service, charges, partnerships, you know, profit-making assets, the whole thing. What's it been like over time? Because I was saying earlier on, I carried out research on all of you guys. It's been like, and I'm like, my goodness, thank God they're back. You know, because he especially has been away for quite some time. Yeah, you. <laughs> but um, it's a good thing that um, we're all here. So, Ahidi, I'd just like you to um, give a brief overview and what the challenge has been like for you, if there have been challenges for you, and how it's been like, you know, engineering the business yourself. I, I, I think I'd say you were alone doing what you were doing. So how did you get to navigate that? And just a, would I say, to give you some expo, the next question will come in from your background as a musician, right? So let's, let's start off with that. Hi, 
I got it. Okay. All right. okay. <laughs> So do you want me to start with the background or you want me to start with... Well, start, start off with, um, you know, over time, how it's been oh. for you managing the business itself. And then okay. everybody moves in. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Not particularly glad to be sitting beside certain people. <laughs> um, well, that's not what we're here to do. Um, I did my first voiceover in... I think it was March of March. I think it was March of 1990. That was my first voiceover, and um, it was. Um, they just asked me. They said, "Sound like the people on CNN." Gave me a script and said, "See if you can sound like the people on CNN." And um, you know, I did what I could. And. Um, but I got paid, and uh, that's perhaps my first encounter with the business of it. But uh, over the years, uh, and I don't know, I guess maybe this will be a, the experience of a lot of people, when it's something you are gifted with, it really isn't a business, or you don't treat it like a business. So um, throughout my early years, um, I was deeply involved in music, but voiceover was always somewhere there. And uh, every now and again, then I would get called. So among, even amongst the musicians, I was usually the young boy with uh, a little cash in his pocket. Because <laughs> uh, after we would travel and come back, you know, I would always get a little job here, a little job there. And um, I was born, raised in Joss, so I started out in Joss. And uh, after doing voiceover for about, let's see, 1990, 2000, for about 20 years, I came down to Lagos. And then everything changed completely. One of the reasons I came down to Lagos was that uh, in Joss, every time I would put in, so in Joss, I dealt with uh, companies. Uh, and, and there wasn't too much bureaucracy. You know, you could just walk up and say, this is who I am. And usually you're looking at the whole portfolio. You, you offer them, you tell them, I can do billboards, I can do radio, I can do TV, I am the works. And because it's not a very structured place, once you can talk <laughs> and convince them, you get the job. Uh, I also attended a, an American mission school. So my English was better than what you're hearing now, you know. <laughs> at least accent-wise, you know. So if I, when I walked in and I spoke, you know, people always sat up. I was very skinny, you know, had a deep voice, and I spoke very well, you know. So I would get jobs. But for some of the bigger companies, the Coca-Colas, the, um, the bigger companies, every time I would go to them and make a pitch, they would tell me, uh, we can't make that decision now. We need to get in touch with Lagos. And I just got tired of hearing about Lagos. So I decided, all right, so let's go where the, where the action is. And when I got down to Lagos, I realized it was totally, it was a different ball game entirely. My first shock was agencies. I had never even heard of advertising agencies. And when I got to Lagos, I got work on uh, radio, City FM. And a colleague who isn't here yet, Yes, she is. Hi, love. Chioma. Um, Chioma introduced me to my first agency. And initially when she introduced me, I was like, okay, agency. But with time, I got to understand how the industry was structured, structured, how you can't just walk up to a client like I used to, you know, with my whole pitch and get the whole portfolio and, <laughs> you know, uh, but the good thing was that I was making far more money just doing work for the agency than I was being my own CEO in Joss, you know. So um, that changed completely. Of course, I met fantastic people and um, it also put me on my toes. Now, it helped me, but it also did not help me in the sense that um, I also realized that you know, Lagos is very competitive. It's a bit of a jungle. 
Yeah. So I had to kind of uh, streamline what I was doing to attend to the kind of demand that was coming my way. So um, there were a lot of commercials at what I consider to be my peak, you know, because I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, I was probably doing five or six commercials a day. My phone was ringing constantly, maybe except on Sundays. But like five, let's say four. Four was like my average. You know, so on a good day, every day, every day, I had to hire a young man to go around with me. I fired him eventually because he stole, he stole my money. <laughs> but because I was moving from studio to studio, I didn't have time to talk, negotiate. There just wasn't time, you know? So I needed someone to keep track of what I was doing. You know, so... Um, but what it did was that it streamlined me to commercials. You know, so it was just commercials, 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 commercials. And um, there's a certain range you get with commercials. You know, it's either something that has that promo feel or it's something conversational, you know. And then, of course, my own niche, which is more like, uh, I call them beer voices. You know, there's the beer voice. But before I got into that, um, uh, naturally, I'm an avid reader. I read a lot. But I used to do... Uh, accents, I used to do impressions, I used to do all sorts of things. But all of that got knocked off and it was just commercials, commercials, commercials. Occasionally you'd get, um, I am, I'm cold. I'm cold. I mean, my teeth are almost chattering. <laughs> but <laughs> eventually you'll get um, a documentary here, uh, an IVR here. But mostly it's just commercials, 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 commercials. And then gradually, as time went on, I just decided, um, all right, maybe we need to pull, you know, your voice becomes like uh, pure water. <laughs> it's, it, it's almost, it's everywhere. You switch on the radio, it's like, <laughs> you know, you hear like five commercials back to back and it's your voice, you know. So um, I gradually started to pull back as much as I could, uh, trying to put in some of that uh, structure that uh, Wale talked about. Not very easy thing to do. Uh, and then try to up my prices a little bit, you know, and um, start to delve into a couple of other things. And um, uh, I don't know how successful I was with that, but um, eventually I allowed myself to get distracted by a couple of other things business-wise. I got married early. I have a lot of children, you know, so you have to think very strategically. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I got up to where I am now. I have a, a few, few clients, just a few. Um, but what has happened is that, <laughs> but what has happened is that, um, you know, those few clients, they take care of you. Uh, <laughs> but I'm doing more more uh, documentaries now. Uh, I got into audio books uh, a little a little while ago, mostly for churches. But I mean, I just rounded up. I did one with um, they're like a volunteer. Um, what do you call it? You you volunteer. Okay. They do audio books for children, you know. So you volunteer, and I volunteered, and um, I just got through that now. You know, I've done a couple of uh, audio books for companies in the U.S., in the U.K., and, um, you know, but my interests have kind of, and today has been special for me, and I'll wrap up with this. Today has been special for me because, because of you. Um, I've always loved, uh, like I said, I went to a mission school, but my ability to speak really came from Sesame Street. We grew up on Sesame Street, you know, absolutely. And um, growing older, I realized that kids these days don't have the opportunity, the, the privilege, and it seems they don't even have the options, you know, to be exposed to the kind of 
quality, well-researched, well-delivered programming that we had, purposeful programming that we had, you know. And um, so that's where my heart is, and, and, and that's what I've given myself to. So, um, yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Hide. Um, for the, those who are fans of Panam Persipol, this guy was the, the bass voice you always heard. This guy. So I, 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 I'm correct, right? Yeah. Praise him. The Lord of Love. No, he'll do it better. <laughs> you know, so, and I was like, whoa, okay. Um, and I think I, I first encountered um, your work um, with an audio book and um, I think a movie you did. And I said, this, these are the people that we need to launch us forward. The people who've been there for quite some time and I would not blame that generation because I mean, they did fantastic work at the time. So um, let, let's just move, move along. Um, Lord Frank, um, I have a thing for, uh, for ask for addressing people by their names. First, the first question I'd like to ask, is that your real name? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, because a lot of people <laughs> with my, with, with, I have, I have um, a background of about 10, 10 plus years in radio and I, I have this thing where I, I, you know, get to introduce people and let people know this is the real name, this is not the real name, this is, you know. And the first time I heard a commercial from you, um, I worked with um, Rhythm 94.7 in Abuja. And I had that thing where I get permission to unmask voiceover artists. And then I heard yours, I think it was um, Heritage Bank. And I was like, my goodness, who is this guy? And someone responded to me on YouTube, Lord Frank. I said, from where? of Birmingham Palace or something, or Buckingham Palace, I'm like Lord Frank, you know, and I got to find out that, I mean, he's, he's everywhere, you, look, you see him, it's not like he's hidden. So I would like you to, chiming on this, you know, respond to how it's been for you, because I was saying that I, you, you came back in 2011, right? Yeah, and um, how have you navigated uh, the waters? Because I know where you, I don't know where you came from, if it was, <laughs> if it was the U.S. or Europe or some other African country, what was it like for you there and um, coming into Nigeria? Because I mean, he did just expose Lagos now. See, I was in Delta State, and it was just like you said: move up, go somewhere, and you have the confidence to speak to a client or a company. And they're like, "Well, okay." <laughs> when you come to Lagos, it's a different. First, I went to Abuja, and I saw the bougie version of Lagos. So I come down here and I'm like, it's a jungle. So what was it like for you? I believe it was kind of bougie for you there too. <laughs> so yeah. Um, first of all, let me just commend the organizers of this particular conference, first and foremost. Okay. Um, because as everybody knows, not a lot of people give us too much respect when it comes to this industry. But when you put a crown on your head, people will take notice. And that crown is this conference, things like this. So, um, shout out to Emmanuel and the speakers and you guys for being here. I commend you all, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, now, to answer your question, um, coming from the US, I came in roughly around 2011, but I started to make moves around 2013 the names that are coming up. And I met, I have to mention some people, Choma, Mr. Ambrose, uh, Joy, I don't know where she went to, but she was in here. And these two gentlemen here that I hate so much. <laughs> people, people, people come up to me and say, look, Frank, we're here, we're everywhere. I'm like, these two guys here. When he said you heard them back to back, he was not kidding. I was driving in my car and I heard Back to back, I had to call some people. I'm like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I know how to do this too. But this guy, Eric, he does the same thing. One day, he's a back to back. I'm like, wow. I mean, you have to give them a round of applause. I mean, uh, ex extremely gifted, 
extremely gifted. And we have some um, fantastic uh, up-and-comers who have made a name for themselves. Stephanie, one of, one of those, uh, uh, don't forgive me for calling you up-and-coming. <laughs> but you're doing extraordinary well, so I, I just want to commend you. Um, in terms of my experience, when I came in, like he said, we were going through agencies, walking through agencies, you get calls and you go to the studios. And because of the, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but because of the bad experiences that I've had, I just decided I'm just gonna work from home, get my setup and just to work from home. Uh, because I am kind of, I'm kind of the person that I want control. I want as much control as I, I, I can get. If I have that control, I believe I can do my best work with that much control. I know we were talking earlier about, you know, don't, don't fall in love with your idea, but I'm sorry. <laughs> because you, if you believe in something strongly, you just have to stand with it. And like he was saying, um, he's saying, uh, when the client hears it, and you know it doesn't match their product or their audience, you can pass on it. It's like you, you, you go on a content, content you watch TV, you don't like it, switch your channel, go to something else. You were talking earlier about um, local voices. Fine, that is not me, you know. I know where I am, I know where I stand. I'm not gonna fight you on that. But when the money is more than dollars, yeah, you're going. <laughs> um, so just to make it short and sweet, that has been my experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, Eric, you 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 do have a background uh, with um, the agencies we seem to have been <laughs> bring about, and it's I think out of everyone here, he has uh, uh, one of the would I say the highest. I, I I sat down to do this thing, and you know we're not really a data driven society. You know, and it was pretty difficult. It was while I was doing theirs, I encountered yours. That's Lord Frank. And I'm like, me, I'm already tired of uh, are you there? Who is this guy? So, but you know, coming back to you, yeah, it's um I'd like to also know what your take is. I know we ha we don't have much time, but I think we're just gonna pull everything together. What's it been like for you, especially from your experience? looking at uh, the cost, setting the business up yourself. The competition is, you know, the competition is, is, is crazy now. But we know it's, at the same time, you look at it and sometimes like, there's, is there, there too little work? Or is there, there too many voice artists, is it? So what's it been like for you from, looking at it from your experience, cost, setting up, moving through, because you have a background in music too. Yeah. What's it been like for you switching? I wanted to also ask Ahide that because, you know, the, the whole idea is, you know, being moving between those things or doing it together. And what would you tell those who are coming after this? Okay. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Apologies for my lateness. So before I answer the question, um, I'm just honored to be here. Um, I'm a parrot naturally. I talk for a living, so I can I can probably talk for the next one hour. And uh, King E will have to switch off the microphone for me to stop. Um, he does that sometimes. Um, I'm especially honored to be here with them because there was a time we were called the Three Kings of Radio. It was... I can't remember when. It was after the... Uh, survey they did when you had 70% of the commercial space. And then following year after that, three of us combined had about 90% of the commercial space. And I was like, eh, okay. I don't know why I'm always paired with these guys. You hear the texture of their voice, right? I'm an everyday guy. I'm not like them. <laughs> I'm the guy you will see at the bus stop. I'm the guy you will go and buy something from in the shop. Yes. She's fond of doing that. Don't worry. We're used to it. But going back to the question here, yeah? 
So, um, unlike them, I've lived here all my life, or the most parts of my life. And I started from a music background, uh, classical music for that matter. And it wasn't... Um... So my first influence with voiceovers was my uncle, His Royal Highness Igwe Lazarus Ekweme. And he was orator for Unilag for about 38 years. And one of the most difficult things you could possibly do is try and read a speech in front of him. Because this guy, this guy had like 12, 12 degrees from music down to English literature. And let me put this in pidgin terms. They're not born you were to talk anyhow around him. And he was a black belt in Shotokan Karate. So imagine a situation where you're, you're in the car with him or somewhere and you're reading something. <laughs> he was the reason I did Shotokan Karate as well because at some, at some point I had to learn how to block the kicks. <laughs> but, you know, it was difficult for me because you have a, a mother who believes that you must have the Igbo spirit in you. You must learn how to speak your language. This Igbo you are speaking, I don't like it. And then you had a father too who was like, eh, well, it depends. You, when you are here, do this. When you are here, do that. And then you have a situation and you put me in the mix and I'm always with my uncle. So the English language was like first love for me. Then, you know, growing up in the area, I had to learn pigeon as well. Yeah. But, you know, but it was, I wouldn't say it's a jungle. I would say it's just pure chaos. That's the best way I can put it. Because um, there are structures that are in place. At the same time, there are people who just devote themselves to scattering those structures. Those structures, yeah. So that's the that's the biggest aspect that caused a lot of problems as I entered the business. I started from a musical point of view. Then I entered a communications company, and that's uh, my first voiceover was on seventeenth of August, uh, two thousand and what six? Yes. So it was a studio upstairs. I heard it was a studio. And I was excited. Oh, there's a music studio upstairs. And I, I ran upstairs and I was like, yo, music. And then um, my old neighbor, Il Rhymes, was doing a job for Music Africa. I don't know if you guys remember what Music Africa is. Yeah. And then he was doing something for Music Africa and Nokia. And um, the other guy, DJ Ade Lure, was doing for something for Hypno Shirts. Oh, oddly enough, that's what I'm wearing. And then... Um, he said something. I was like, no, that's not to say. Why don't you say like this? I had never done, done voiceovers before. I had never had any radio experience. But I was one of those guys who, when they do an advert on TV. Okay. Hey, that's how it sounds. Okay. In a world. Okay. In a place. In a time. And you watch, and my influences were never Nigerian adverts because I, I won't lie. Sometimes it was a laugh. I couldn't concentrate on the advert. I was like, can you imagine that guy was like, <laughs> so that was how it was for me. But experience wise, over time, I realized that if I was going to go beyond the scope of where I was, I had to expand. This man here, he gave me one of the toughest times of my life. I did a job for an agency. It was, I thought, as in, I got a standing ovation from even the MD. I was like, yes, that's me. And then the following day, I got a call. Oh, Eric, sorry, um, somebody, we're going with somebody else. Who? And there he was. That day, same day I did the job. He was standing there in the background, quiet, you know, in the corner. He took the job from me. <laughs> then he took another one from me. Then he took another one from me. It's okay, no problem. And then one day he calls me and says, yo, you took that job from me. I said, yes, me and you, this business. <laughs> but that's the thing. Um... I see them as, not competition, but as brothers, because we build each other. I, I don't know if you ever listened to that um, poem by the late Robin Williams, you are my adversary, but you're not my enemy. So that's basically it. That's what they do for me. They push. Because stagnation will keep you there. And you know, people just cross the line on a daily basis. There used to be a time when they were, they were called, there was a, something called the five divas of voice. Choma, KP, Diola, Joy, and um, 
uh, what's her name again? Uh, Ibuku. They were the five divas of voice. Everywhere you would go, every, if it wasn't those five. But people are breaking the ceiling constantly. Stephanie is dominating the female. Okay, I didn't expose you. But you know, she's, I think people are just churning through the ceiling, kicking the doors down. Nobody cares anymore because the space is growing. People, and I say to people, look, there's enough space for everyone. Or like the former Skybank um, slogan, there's enough sky for all the stars. But people don't know this. And sometimes people just want that relevance. They want to get through the door. They don't, sometimes don't realize that it's patience. You study the environment. Know where you're going. Have a plan. Because when you kick the door down without realizing what you're going to do after the door comes down, problem. But when you have an idea of, okay, so most likely when I kick the door down, the next person will coming across will come with a shield. You said you have your own shield. You're ready. You're, pl- you're prepared for everything. So, you know, you have to do that. And you have to learn to expand yourself even beyond the scope of what you're used to doing. So from commercials, you, do- you jump into all kinds of things. I've done, the only category I don't like is audiobooks. I don't have the patience. Me on another verse. I don't have the, I don't have the patience for audiobooks. As in that process of sitting down and you sit down one place all day reading I can't do it. He can. I, I, mm, because as a classical singer, you're used to jumping around. So, and then someone tells you, sit down. So it's obvious there are strengths. So, oh, no, I can't. As in, when Remy does it, when. when <laughs> you wonder. How? Mm. After five minutes, I'll get up. I'll kill myself. So, you need to know your strengths. And once I realized that I had a very short attention span, I always stuck to short form narration. It helped me out a lot. So documentaries, three, five minutes, 10 minutes. Once Chema almost roped me to something about uh, 30 minutes per episode. And I said to her, Chema, this is about to do. Oh, God. <laughs> Even if they release the angels from heaven, they will not make me stay one place. Home. But, you know, that's what, that's what you get once you understand yourself and understand the market you're going into. And, of course, like we all have, we ventured up. I have said it when I heard the uh, Red Pepper's voice. I said, Red Pepper, I like your voice, so, but you need to hear Lord Frank then you might reconsider how wonderful you think you'll sound. Round of applause, please, because, you know, we need to, to herald our own. Like he, like he just said, we have ours and building and staying together as much as, you know, we are adversaries. That's simply because there's, it's, it's, it's huge. There are different niches. Everyone here taking up a mic, you, you understand how different we sound. And there's just so much. CJ Kings, shout out to you, bro. What you did here, you know, I think about it. Some of our old literature books, it just trans, you know, trans, would I say, transferred me or transfigured me. I don't know. The, <laughs> you know, you start, you start seeing yourself hearing the combination of voices and, you know, the sound. It's, it's huge work. And I believe, like uh, ABC said, it's a huge pot of soup. Meet day for everybody. That's the truth. It did. <laughs> so um, we, we're, we're taking uh, so much time, you know, and we could stay ours. Shout out to our online viewers too. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Um, one final question to just go, because I'm pretty old school. I write a lot of stuff too. I have not asked you up to half of the questions, but let's just wrap this up. Uh, yes, we'll just, <laughs> yeah, one, one, one. You know, let's just go through. So, um, uh, Lord Frank. <laughs> yeah. Are you like? Don't, don't be angry. So, what's the appropriate, from your experience, what's the appropriate um, or ideal scenario, yeah, of a business relationship between, you know, voiceover artist and um, maybe a media agency or client, you know, from inception of the job? Because there's, you know, some people don't understand that there is a way things should be. And then there is the way some people want it to be. So sometimes you are torn in between, this is what client wants. This is how they want it. You are more exposed. It's your job. And even though they have the idea, you're able to put it out for them. So what would be the ideal or appropriate scenario? you know, between that relationship. How, how would you describe that? Uh, so that I, 
I understand correctly. So are you referring to just doing the job or the whole aspect of exactly do, doing the job just from when okay you get to contact them okay. how you contact them that how you deliver what they want okay. straight up to the end of the, of the job okay even though um, I'm trying not to work with agencies anymore yeah. but let me let me say um, so they, they get the brief they contact you, whoever wants who they believe fits and um, for me I get it at home I go to my studio and um, I give different deliveries, you know, I give options, right? Of course, they want, I give them what exactly what they want, but I give options, what I believe it, it, it calls for. Um, and my main thing is the script. People will say, uh, we want a natural feel, we want this kind of feel, and the, but the script tells you a lot of things. If, if, if you don't have it in the script, it makes it difficult, I don't know, unless you're talking to gentlemen like these or uh, professionals like that. But the script is where it lives, right? Give me the script, let me read it through. I know exactly what I'm reading. I know what you want me to say, but don't come and say, don't give me an epic script and ask me to do it in a child's voice. It wouldn't work, right? But I'll give you what you want. And then I'll give you my my own, and then you can choose whatever you want to do. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's move straight to Ahide. Yeah. Um, so I'm saving you for last because you will chop all the time. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. So. Um, what would you say is? You know, because from your background, you know, moving through, it's, it's, a, it's a different business, music, and, you know. So how do you get to navigate those waters for you, putting yourself out there, marketing? I mean, Wally said a whole lot today about that. How has that played out for you? I mean, since you came to Lagos, how many years ago? The, the landscape has changed a lot. So um, what's it like for you now? And what do you think works best, depending on whatever niche you're doing, if it's audiobooks or commercials or you know, whatever it is concerning, you know, voiceovers. What approaches do you think voiceover artists should? Because the competition, like, <laughs> we know what it's like. Setting yourself apart. What's it like for you and how have you been able to do that so far? Well, uh, just want to sound a little bit like uh, Frank. <laughs> Just so that uh, we get it straight, you can't intimidate me. Uh, let's see. I can turn this back on. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't matter, man. Doesn't matter. Please, please, please. Let's let's right stop this. <laughs> I told you I don't like to sit beside certain people. Don't provoke me. Um, <clears throat> I, I think um, in, in terms of approach, I think just practice makes per perfect. Get really good at what you do and find out what you, what you can really do and do well and commit yourself to it. Um, I think it helps you to weed out um, some of the things that you don't um, necessarily, it'll make things easier for you. I, I think basically that's it. So that where I am now has been a process of just weeding. So I, I knew that I can, I can do commercials, but it's not really my, you know, commercials are like, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, the word that comes to my mind is prostitution. <laughs> But <laughs> do you understand? It, it, it's it's this is what we want. You know, you just deliver, you go. This is the script. You just boom, and you're gone. You to get your money, you go. You know, there, there's no there's no connect. The the audio book I just did is is a story about a, a Somalian refugee who lives in a refugee camp in Kenya. And the process of him, and he has a, a younger brother, 
and eventually they get re resettled to the, to the U.S., all right? And it's the whole process of what their lives were like then and, you know, what led to them being resettled in the U.S. Now, the, the, it's immersive. You know, you have to read the story. You have to understand the story. Uh, and, and you have to, because I did it over a couple of months, and that's because I got distracted, yeah? Other things to do. But it, it would always take me a day or two to get back into form to continue from where I started. Because if you are not in the story, you can't, with an audio book, you can't just perform and go. It's not that easy, you know. And then, of course, there, there are several characters. And so you're doing a woman's voice, but it's still your voice. But you're doing a version of your voice that is a woman's voice. And you're doing a version of your voice that is a child's voice. You know, and then there are different characters and you have to switch and you have to remember <laughs> and be consistent what character had this voice you know so it, it's it's more work than than a commercial but it's 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 yes it's more engaging to me it's there, there's a beautiful side of it that you i, I can't find in commercials you know and it, it's it's engaging it's challenging it's tasking it really takes you uh, to your limit. And even when I accepted the job, I knew it was going to be tough, but they were very gracious. And they told me, they said, look, we've, we've been through this so many times. We're used to this. You know, when I couldn't deliver my deadlines, um, I just call and, you know, let them know. Now, which is another thing. You asked me the transition between music um, and in, into one of the things that music did for me. I didn't do music as a business. It was ministry. But one of the things it did for me was that I got to meet a lot of people and I learned how to talk and interact with people. Um, so things like meeting up with deadlines, um, being able to negotiate is something that is not difficult for me. You know, being able to also um, be upfront with people. For almost all the... Um, jobs I have done, whether commercials or otherwise, one of the things I look out for is when I'm done, am I happy? Am I happy at the end of, you know, it, the worst thing you can do to me is give me a job. <laughs> you know, I'm not happy about the job. And you know, the worst thing you can do is pay me. No, underpay me, but pay me up front. <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced this. It's rare, but I have experienced it. Where you, you get suckered into taking a certain amount, they pay you up front. And then you find out that the job they said, this is what the job was, is not what the job actually was. So you got suckered into, you know, and, and, the, you know, and the people are nasty and you're done, you've spent the money, you have to do the job, you do the job, you feel horrible. I don't know, it takes away a piece of my soul. And you know, and I have worked on several jobs. And you keep on hearing, but I've paid you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, it just taught me how to, how to negotiate. So, know, know your craft. It, it really helps. You know, I mean, even when I talked about doing four commercials a day, it, it was just a matter of the craft. You know, most people that came to me for commercials came for two reasons. One, we heard about you. And then two, we heard about you. You know, and it's usually you do it quickly, you do it well, you know, and usually when they present it to their client, no questions. So they just keep coming back. You know, so um, I, don't, I, I guess. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Ahie. <laughs> so uh, finally, uh, let's just wrap this up. Um, we've all heard of, um, I think the dream, the key word and the dream for every voiceover artist would be getting jobs as regularly as possible. 
you know, and sustaining that, knowing that um, within the next one, two weeks, you get this, it's on the way, and they're not nasty people, you know, they're able to deliver the job on time, and they even spread the word, you understand? So, um, I'm coming to you now, Ahide, so we'll just wrap this up. We've got about five, five minutes. Uh, so, a picture of this, uh, yeah, you, you get a gig, satisfy the client, you know, secure the bag, hit the jackpot. How do you get that retainer? Is there a way? Because, you know, sometimes people, people understand that, you know, the, the client or the, the customer might have different needs. You know, but how do you get to stay on that customer's mind when that need comes? Or maybe they try to explore different sides with okay. you, you know? So how do you get to work that out? Okay, before I answer that, please, it's on record. If you have a deep voice to sell anything, so please, when he tells you that a client doesn't complain, it's because of the depth of his voice. If you do that with me, you know you will not answer. So now back to the question. Um, really, a good job brings back more jobs. That's the easiest way to put it. Now, once you understand what your client wants, there was a time, and Ahidi and Lord Frank know this, there was a time in our lives where all four of the telecom brands wanted us on their projects, even though they knew that the next person had us on board. Remy, you understand this, yes. So you need to understand Glow's request, MTN's request, Airtel's request, Nine Mobile's request. So you have to understand each of their markets. So you had to change your voice based on the market you were selling. So the way you would sound on Airtel would be different from the way you sound on Glow which will be different from the way you sound on MTN, which will be different from the way you sound on Nine Mobile. And that is understanding the clients that you have. Once you do that and you consistently give them what is within their scope of a standard, it's just a matter of time before they reach out to you. Yo, um, so because you've been doing stuff for us and we like it, we'd like to keep you on board. Airtel is a typical example. For, uh, for the last, what, four or five years, I hear this voice has been the voice on it. Airtel, the smartphone network. Same thing with Lord Frank. There was time it was all of empty and all, all the place. So that's the thing. If they like the way you treat their brand, the way their brand sounds on your tongue, they will come back for more. It's just a matter of time before they say, yo, can we sign a contract? That's typically just it. Sometimes it's just as easy as that. Um, no, I can't do this job without Ahide. No, 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 I'm sorry. I heard the, he has a good voice, but there's a way Ahide says our brand, you know, that's the way I want it. Oh, no, 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 Lord Frank. No, the way Lord Frank rolls the R and no. See, I don't want anybody else. It has to be Lord Frank. That's how it is. When you treat that brand like you treat yourself sometimes, they feel like they're part of your story and you feel that way as well about them. So it's just a matter of time. So a good job brings more good jobs. A great job means, and that's a line of great jobs means it's a matter of time before they call you and say, we need a retainer. Simple. All right, people, I think uh, this is where we get to draw the curtain on this panelist session. Let's give a round of applause to Lord Frank, Ahide Abdu, and Eric Maximus of Kerber. It's been fantastic with you guys. Thank you very much. Where you guys go, huh?